China is gradually losing manufacturing to Vietnam, Malaysia, Bangladesh, India, and Taiwan. And it's happening across consumer categories, including clothing, footwear, furniture, and a bunch of various goods. And that is only the tip of the iceberg in this story. With a massive population, a booming economy, and a rapid industrialization, many experts of the past few decades predicted that China would soon overtake the United States. But as the years have gone by, China got stuck in the mud while India actually pushed forward. Sure, India isn't there yet. It still struggles with poverty, corruption, social inequality issues. All that is 100% true. But its long-term trajectory is absolutely insane. And I'm about to show you that in this video. Now, what used to be a poor, slow-growing country now has the fifth largest gross domestic product and one of the fastest growing economies in the world. With a population of over 1.4 billion people, a strong tech industry, a growing middle class, and a terrific demographic situation, India is entering the next decade as a major force to be reckoned with, while China is heading in the opposite direction. So how did China managed to lose its edge. And just as importantly, how did India manage to dig itself out of the hole into the fast track to success? Now, let's start with China. Since I can remember myself, China was always the most populated country on Earth. However, being this big was not always a good thing for this 1.4 billion people nation it had to endure some serious hardships. The worst of it came 65 years ago in 1950 when Chairman Mao Zedong launched the Great Leap Forward, an ambitious plan aimed at quickly industrializing and modernizing China, but eventually ending up in a faceplant of epic proportions. The idea was to push forward agricultural and industrial development at the same time and do it fast. That meant forming state-owned and managed communities, which then combined several hundred households into a collective unit. Now, these communes started using primitive backyard furnaces for the production of steel and other industrial goods. And at the same time, they started building irrigation projects to actually increase agricultural productivity. The idea was simple, a complete mobilization of epic proportions of the entire population of China to work towards the common goal of improving the industrial and agricultural infrastructures overnight. It was an adaptation of the Russian Kalkhoz system from the late 1920s, with a twist. While the Kalkhoz was focused strictly on agriculture, the Chinese version was aimed to achieve instant agricultural and industrial development at the same time and do it quickly. And that is where it fell apart. Now, while the Kalkhoz in the Soviet Union lasted for several decades until it actually fell apart with a bang, the Chinese system fell apart almost on launch. The diversion of resources away from agriculture to industry caused widespread famine in China that killed millions, tens of millions of people. However, by the late 1970s, things for China have finally started to turn around. After Mao Zedong's death in 1976, Deng Xiaoping actually started to loosen up its policies. The concept was to open up Chinese economy to market reforms known as the Reform and Opening Up Policy. Now, the reforms abolished Mao's centrally planned economy towards somewhat free market-oriented system with private ownership, foreign investments, and the development of export-oriented industries. It worked. China grew faster than anyone has ever imagined before. Nobody has ever seen this before. Its gross domestic product between 1990 and 2010 was consistently in double digits. We have never ever seen this before from any country, especially the world's largest population. It seemed that China was destined for greatness. Having the world's largest population, along with Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms, made China an incredible success story. 
In fact, my dad used to tell me I should learn Chinese back then. As the Chinese economy grew at a staggering pace, it quickly became the world's second biggest economy, just behind the United States, and it became a serious counterpower to the American hegemony following the falling apart of the USSR. And for the first time since that fall of the Soviet Union, we had a challenger. <laughs> Investments made by the Chinese government in technology, military, infrastructure, all of these pushed the economy ahead at an unrivaled pace, all while increasing its geopolitical sphere of influence through programs like the Built and Road Initiative in Africa. Things were going great. And many economists and financial experts actually started predicting that China will not only challenge the United States, that it would actually overtake it and become the number one global superpower in the world. Shout out to Ray Dalio. Now, there was only one problem. China never had a chance. Remember Deng Xiaoping, the guy who opened up the Chinese economy and started its massive economic growth cycle? Well, he also made a few critical mistakes, and one of them would end up dooming China about 40 years down the road. During the late 1970s, China's growing population began to strain the country's resources and infrastructure. Now, to address that problem, Deng Xiaoping implemented the one-child policy, which was introduced in 1979 and lasted all the way to 2015. Now, the basic principle of this rule was to limit most urban couples to having only one kid. Couples who failed to comply faced harsh fines, harsh penalties, such as the loss of government benefits, loss of job opportunities. This was a serious deal. Now, there's a story in China about a couple who actually decided to pay the fine willingly to have a second child, hoping that after they had a girl the first time, they would be in a boy situation. However, they ended up having a second girl and named her Fei Hong which translates to color TV in English. Now, the couple reportedly chose this name because they had money they saved up to buy color TV, but ended up paying the fine. And they saw this daughter as a replacement for that color TV, which they've hoped to buy. Now, the one-child policy had a significant impact on China's demographic. It led to the significant decline in the country's birth rate, and it slowed down population growth. It worked. Only problem is it worked too well. It actually created a lot of unintended consequences, including gender imbalance. Many families preferred to have boys and resorted to sex-selective abortions, sometimes even worse things, which I won't mention here, to achieve this goal. As a result of this one-child policy, China's fertility rate decreased dramatically. In 1980, the fertility rate in China was 2.8 children per woman. By 2010, it had dropped to 1.6, and that was a huge problem. Because you see, for a population to stay the same size and not drop in the long run, each couple needs to have 2.1 children on average. That is called the replacement rate, which is a measure that predicts the future population growth or decline based on the fertility rate of women. Each child replaces each parent, one and one. And 0.1 children replace the babies that pass away during birth. So if the replacement rate is below 2.1, which it was for China since 2010, it indicates that the population will eventually decline over time. Now, for the past 30 years, China had a replacement rate of 1.2 children per couple, which is well below the minimum replacement rate. How bad is it? Well, in 2022, China actually had more deaths than births. That's the first time that happened since the 1960s famine, which killed millions of people, tens of millions of people, which should give you an indication of how bad things are getting. That imbalance in the Chinese family demographics is commonly referred to as the 4 to 1 family structure. That's not a football formation. It actually is a thing. Now, the 4 to 1 refers to a family structure in which a single kid supports two parents, and four grandparents as they age. When the burden of supporting multiple elderly relatives is falling on only one child, and given the fact that every year there are fewer young people to support that aging population in China, the end result is clear. 
the ability of these young kids to carry the load will keep diminishing every single year until they inevitably collapse. Not to mention the other common issues with an increased aging population, such as elevated costs of healthcare, elevated costs of social welfare. The government has to spend way more money with population getting older. And that issue is only getting worse in China. Now, to address this issue, China has abandoned, it canceled the one-child policy, and it did so in 2015. And it implemented a wide array of policies that are intended to increase childbirth. But it did little to change its trajectory. Although the policy was canceled, many couples who grew up under the policy simply adapted to the idea of having only one kid, especially as the cost of living in China risen so sharply in the last few years, especially in the cities. The one-child policy left a long-lasting scar on the Chinese culture. The one child of that family must make it. He has to make it. He has to make it count. So young Chinese professionals have become super hyper-focused on pursuing their careers, their education, over having kids. Personal fulfillment, personal development is now more important to young adults in China than having kids. And that's sad. More than 30,000 respondents took a poll posted by a government-owned state news agency in China. And they overwhelmingly said they were not considering having more than one kid, even with this new policy. Now, that poll was quickly deleted and things have moved on. But the birth rate in China actually fell to a record low of 6.77 births per 1,000 people, down from 7.5 just in 2021. And this is the lowest level it's been since 1949, despite this push from the government to actually encourage more married couples to have sex. <laughs> well, the high cost of living, the extremely competitive workforce, the gender inequality issues, all of these simply disincentivize Chinese women from having children. Now, the Chinese population actually shrank in 2022, the first time in a while. According to estimates by the United Nations, by the year 2050, China's population is expected to decline even further, dropping around 9% from current levels. In 1978, China's median age was 21 and a half years old. In 2020, that median age climbed to 38 and a half years, with 20% of Chinese being 60 and older. Now, according to the National Bureau of Statistics of China, the working age population was around 900 million, which is about 63% of the total population. And as China's population continues to age, this trend will only intensify. And while the United States also struggles with aging population issues, China's situation is significantly worse than the US. According to data from the United Nations, by 2050, China's population aged 65 and over will be a quarter of the entire Chinese population. In comparison, the population aged 65 and over in the United States is expected to only be one-fifth of the population by 2050. Now, the thing is, the U.S. has a cheat code, it has a get-out-of-jail-free card, and China doesn't. The U.S. can periodically improve its situation by immigration. America is the preferred destination for skilled workers, professionals, engineers, doctors from all over the world. These young workers boost the labor force, stimulate economic growth, and offset the declining birth rates in the United States. China is in a very different position for one simple reason. It lacks the ability to attract young, skilled immigrants, and unlike the U.S., it can't alleviate its demographic hardship by opening up the doors and letting workers in. Simple. Now, with every year going by, the pressure on the Chinese social welfare and healthcare systems is increasing, all while economic growth and productivity keep declining. Now, simply put, with fewer working-age people to support the growing number of elderly people in China, a collapse it's just a question of time. And the numbers show exactly that. Between 1991 and 2010, China's GDP growth accelerated at an average annual growth rate of more than 10% per year. But its economic growth has been slowing down in recent years. It's almost unrecognizable. In 2019, well before the pandemic, China's gross domestic product grew by 6.1%, the slowest pace in almost three decades. 
In 2023, China's gross domestic product is expected to grow at a pace of around 5 to 5.5%, a far cry from the double-digit growth of the previous decades. And now we get to the 1.4 billion question. Why is this happening? Well, as anything in life, it's a mixture of multiple factors. Now, obviously, the demographic challenges play a huge part here. Trade tensions with the United States are not helping at all and increasing intervention and control by the Communist Party, as well as political and military instability, are also scaring investors. And foreign investors don't like instability. We all know that. So the potential of war in Taiwan, for example, that isn't helping either. Another important factor is the increasing labor costs in China. You see, China's economy heavily reliant on manufacturing, which makes up about 30% of the country's gross domestic product. However, the declining population in China poses a significant challenge for that specific industry, for the manufacturing sector. With a shrinking workforce and an aging population, manufacturers have difficulties in finding enough skilled labor to maintain their capacity. Now, this labor shortage, which is driven by demographic, is driving up wages in China, which is leading to some manufacturers actually relocating their production to other countries, which actually have less labor costs. That will eventually lead to a slower gross domestic product growth for China. Now, for the past decade, the Chinese average monthly wage grew by almost 120%. Good for them. But the average annual salary costs in China are now about $17,000. Compared to countries like Malaysia with $8,000, or Vietnam with $3,500? Why do you think this shoe I just showed you in the beginning was made in Vietnam and not in China? Simple, because China is too darn expensive. Investor interest is pushed towards other cheaper labor markets. That's how economy works. Now, despite being a hotspot for foreign investment since the 1980s, increased labor costs have driven away a lot of investors from China. How bad is it? Well, brace for impact. Well, foreign direct investments into China over the past three years are down across all sectors. I'm going to give you a taste. Food and financial services are down 66%. Electronics are down over 56%. Software and IT, 50%. Industrial investments, 56%. Business and services are down 42%. You see how bad these are? Well, here's more. Now, Vietnam has now taken the biggest bite out of the Chinese manufacturing capacity with an almost 360% increase in the far distance trade since 2014. But it isn't the only one. Malaysia and Bangladesh have also taken significant apparel manufacturing away from China. China has essentially boxed itself into a corner. High labor costs were already an issue before the pandemic, but the disruption in supply chains and the zero COVID policy have all basically caused China to drive away investors, especially with countries like Vietnam, which is physically close to China and allows for much reduced labor costs. So what did we have here as far as China? Well, a shrinking and aging population, check. Increasing labor costs, check. Strict currency controls, check. Angry neighbors, check. Tough to defend geography, check. Lack of energy independence, check. A total totalitarian regime with no actual rule of law. And all of these are great ingredients for the Chinese economy. No. <laughs> On the other hand, India is a whole different story. The UN is now predicting that India's population is projected to surpass China's sometime in 2023. And some experts are even saying that it could happen within the first half of this year. Now, India's population is expected to get to 1.7 billion within the next 30 years, while China is expected to go below 1 billion by the end of the century. Now, with a labor force of 1 billion people by 2030, a median age of just 29 years old, and with 30% of its population under the age of 25, India has the world's youngest and fastest growing workforce. It has a dream demographic setup. The Indian economy has been growing at an impressive rate in recent years. While Europe and the United States are expected to grow 
what, 1-2% in 2023, India is headed to 6.5% growth this year, which is even higher than China's expected 5-5.5%. to Now, while China's aging population and shrinking workforce is slowing down its economic growth, India is only getting warmed up. In essence, China is the elevator falling from the 50th floor, while India is the elevator going up in the ground level, and this year, they will meet each other on the way. But the problem is they're heading in opposite directions. In 2022, India actually overtook the UK as the world's fifth biggest economy, with a gross domestic product of $3 trillion. And the trend is only getting stronger. According to a report by Ernest Young, India's merchandise exports are projected to grow to $750 billion by 2030. That's a 160% increase in exports from its current levels within 10 years. Now, India's population is projected to continue growing for decades, providing a large pool of skilled, educated, English-speaking, working-age population, which is essential to the growing economy it is starting to actually develop, including high-end professional services that nobody ever thought could be provided out of China. And let me share a personal story with you. During my tenure as a senior manager for Deloitte, one of the world's largest accounting firms, I saw how this process has already started forming. Now, accounting is a big business. The U.S. accounting services industry generates about $130 billion in revenue every single year. U.S. companies are audited by U.S. accounting firms. And that is how it always worked until now. Deloitte actually opened up a local subsidiary in India to do just that. And it's called Deloitte USI, as in United States, India. And it's 50,000 employees provide highly specialized advisory services, compliance services, accounting services, all based on U.S. laws and regulations to U.S. clients from India at Deloitte quality, but at local India prices. And this is just the start of multiple service lines migrating into India in the next 30 years. For example, Apple is now planning to shift around 25% of its production capacity from China to India. Samsung already did that. Samsung already operates the world's largest mobile phone factory in India. The factory is spread over 130 acres and has the capacity to produce up to 120 million mobile phones per year. However, it's not all about the size and the age of the population. As we know, size doesn't always matter. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Michael. 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 <laughs> <laughs> there are equally important factors that play here. You see, despite its many problems, India is actually more democratic than China. It has less capital controls, more transparency, and a more independent judiciary system. These things attract foreign investments to India. Google, for example, significantly increased its presence in India over the past two decades. And with plans to invest 10 more billion in China over the next five to seven years, this trend will only continue. Amazon doing the same thing. Amazon expanded its operations in India with the company investing billions of dollars in its Indian operations and launching several initiatives aimed at supporting small businesses and local entrepreneurs. Coca-Cola, another company that has significantly increased its investments in India. New bottling plants and distribution centers are opening up in India as we speak. The list goes on and on with names like Apple, Samsung, General Electric, and many others that are increasing their exposure to India while decreasing their presence in China. In fact, according to data from the Indian Ministry of Commerce, foreign direct investments in India increased by 27% just in one year in 2021. Now, as more investors flood into India, its economy is growing even faster, which in turn attracts even more investors. And that continues as India is leapfrogging over China right in front of our eyes. And it will continue to do so for the following reasons. India's geography places it at the crossroad of key global trading routes, shipping mains, natural resources. All will enhance its economic and geopolitical influence over time. And while China shares borders with 14 countries, many of whom it has serious conflicts with, ongoing military disputes, not to mention issues with Taiwan, India only has borders with six countries. Now, you would agree with me, right, that dealing with 40 neighbors is a lot more complicated than doing it with six. Don't get me wrong. India isn't sitting around the campfire singing Kumbaya 
with its neighbors. Let's get something straight here. It has its problems, but it has done a much better job at keeping things cool and calm when it compares to China. Now, over the years, India has successfully resolved many of its border disputes with its neighbors and in a peaceful way through negotiations. They worked shit out. India and Bangladesh are no longer in conflict ever since they resolved their issues back in 2015. The issues with Sri Lanka, that got worked out back in 1974. Same with Myanmar in the 1990s. At the end of the day, India has a good relationship with most of its neighbors, such as Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, while China is on the brink of war with Taiwan and in the midst of territorial disputes with multiple other neighbors. This allows India to spend less money on protecting its borders and more in growing its economy, which is by definition an enhancement to its regional geopolitical influence. (laughs) What about energy though, right? Good question. Both India and China are heavy energy importers, but India has a much better setup, even though it imports about 87% of its total oil, making it the third largest oil import in the world after the US and after China. However, while India's energy consumption is growing rapidly, it is still much, much lower than China's. Well, it simply needs less oil than China, and that's what's bailing it out. But it also has done much better at developing and adapting solar and wind energy resources. I mean, its renewable energy projects are light years better than China's. The other thing is that India has better relations with everybody. India managed to stay in the middle and not pick a side at any fight. (laughs) They have better relations with the United States and China. They have better relations with the EU compared to China. This means that India gets many foreign dollars and euros invested into its renewable energy research and development. In contrast, China is facing ongoing criticism from the US, from the EU. It's facing a lot of issues on the geopolitical stage. It simply doesn't get the attention and the cuchachos and the foreign investments into renewable energy from the US and the EU as India is getting. On top of that, India's strategic location in the Indian Ocean and its great relations with other countries, they're all factors to success. They allow India to have access to energy resources from all over the world, including the Middle East, Africa, you name it. All things considered, India got a better hand in this poker game. Now, of course, there are still challenges that India will need to overcome, such as corruption, poverty, infrastructure bottlenecks out of hell, bureaucratic red tape, income inequality. The recent scandal around Adani Group and their ties to the government is a great example of the issues still being battled by India to this day. That's part of the journey. For India to truly become a high-income country, it has to solve its poverty problem first. As of 2023, 10% of people in India live on less than $10 per day. India's current per capita GDP of $2,200 puts it at the 122nd place in the world, behind Belize, Bhutan, El Salvador. It's a far cry from China's $12,500. It's a far cry from the United States' $68,000. It's simply not there yet. Extreme poverty in India is a significant challenge that is holding back its economy. According to the World Bank, about 60 million people in India live in extreme poverty. I'm talking lack of access to food, clean water, healthcare, education, housing. Now, that lack of access to education and healthcare for tens of millions of people will cause lower consumption. It will cause increased healthcare costs for the country. And it doesn't help when large amounts of government funding intended to offer solutions to these problems is being hijacked along the way due to high corruption, especially in local government. Eventually, this situation can actually lead to social unrest in India. We've seen that happen. That would be a death blow to foreign investments. Solving poverty is not easy, but India has to do it. And here's how. Increase access to education and healthcare, improvement of social welfare systems, the removal of structural inequalities, stopping Hindu radicals from oppressing minorities, improving gender equality, allowing equal access to resources and opportunities for everyone. 
On top of that, India has to liberalize the economy much further, improve governments, reduce corruption, mainly on the local levels. And despite its problems with the right policy, the right implementation, the right investments, India has an amazing setup to become a major economic powerhouse in the coming years. And it has a good chance of surpassing China as the world's second largest economy. It won't be easy, but you know what they say. Today we tackle what's hard. Tomorrow we'll do the impossible. Now, before I let you go, I want you to check out today's sponsor, a free research tool for investors you have to try. It's called Tendies. As you can see, 2023 is shaping up to be an absolutely bonkers year. Just when you think it can't get any worse, things find a way to get even more hectic. The stock market is like a Picasso painting at this point. You can kind of see where the face is, but I mean, the ears are here, the eyes are here, the nose is here. The parts are there. You can see it's sort of a face, but where is it? You need a roadmap. Now, obviously, making sense of all of this chaos is critical for any good investor. And that is why you need to check out Tendies using the link below. What you'll find there is a free research tool with tons of resources to help you better understand the market as an investor, especially in these crazy times. Now, doing exactly that was always the goal of my channel. And that is why I'm super excited and pumped to team with these guys. Tendies is legit. Now, and for those of you who are involved in options, they got you covered as well. They got filtered order flows, a complete professional options calculator, which can actually connect directly to your brokerage so you can get only the information relevant to your portfolio. So filter out the noise, get attendees by using the link below. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video.